How's it going everyone? As always, my name is Jimmy Champagne and this is PS Ready, my channel all about PlayStation. I am trying my hardest to get to 200,000 subs. So whether you're new here or you've been here for a while, as long as you love PlayStation, this is gonna be the channel for you. So help me out by subscribing and setting your notifications to all. In today's video, I've got two topics to talk about with you guys because they are gonna be meaty. The first one is that it's the end of an era for the PlayStation 5 and we're gonna talk about where things are going from here. And the second topic is we now know what a game is going to need to do to be called enhanced once the PS5 Pro comes out later this year. I know saying the end of an era for PlayStation sounds like a little dramatic, but it really is because Jim Ryan is officially gone from PlayStation. His last day was Friday. He is officially retired. He's done at PlayStation and taking over for him is Hiroki Totoki. And even though he's kind of officially retired now, we've already seen Totoki sort of stepping into the role as his new job as interim CEO while they look for someone to replace Jim Ryan. And honestly, I really like the approach so far that Totoki has been taking. We heard that he kind of is going into all these studios with the mentality of being more hands-on. Before, with Sean Layden, I think that was definitely the strategy where he would kind of actually know what was going on in the studios. He was definitely in the know when it came to playing video games, and he understood what made a good game. And because of that, we saw some incredible stuff come out of Sony while he was the CEO of the company. Depending on who you ask or what you're talking about, the situation with Jim Ryan for the entire time that he was CEO has been pretty mixed, I would say. I mean, in the positive angle that you can look at, it's hard not to like at least give him a little credit for how good of a job he did, kind of getting the PS5 launched during the year of 2020. And under him, we did get some pretty good games. I mean, if you want to talk about criticism though, obviously the fact that all the games that he released lately have been coming out on PS5 and PS4, we're just starting to get into the PS5 generation. And while we're just starting to get these games that actually take advantage of the PS5, uh, a lot of these uh, games that are coming out don't really run all that well unless they're made by Sony. And then even when Sony puts their badge on a game like Rise of the Ronin, performance issues and bugs are kind of plaguing that game. So there's a lot of things you can positively say about him, but there are just about as many that you could criticize him for. So I'm excited about this new role that Totoki is taking on because of that hands-on approach. I want someone going into these studios, kind of keeping them accountable, keeping the budgets in check, and making sure that the game we get at the end of the day is actually a PlayStation quality product that's not just spinning the wheels being a sequel or just more of what we've already seen and most of all performs at a top level of performance and fidelity on the PlayStation 5 because that reputation that Sony had during the PS4 generation where every game would come out and be an absolute banger that ran perfectly it's really starting to slip right like you can look at Days Gone during the PS4 generation and that game at launch I don't think was up to par technically but it was something new for Ben Studios, so that's a mulligan. Every other game that came out ran perfectly and looked amazing. This gen, we've seen weird issues like Spider-Man 2 coming out and needing a multitude of patches over its first week. Final Fantasy 16, I know is third party, but Sony paid for that game and it still came out and ran kind of crappy. And now to this day, does not run at a full 60 FPS. They're just getting started, but we've already had a bunch of remasters and remakes like The Last of Us Part 1 remastered, The Last of Us Part 2 remastered. Like there's things you can definitely look at and say, okay, I understand the strategy there. These games that are new from studios like Naughty Dog, studios like Sucker Punch are taking a long time to develop. Uh, remasters are a good thing to throw in the interim, but like there's a lot of reasons that I think that's not necessarily the best spot for Sony to be in right now. But part of his retirement celebration ceremony, whatever you want to call it, was going on the PlayStation blog podcast, which is like, it's so weird that they have a podcast because it's just like an hour of marketing every week. They can only say positive things about PlayStation because PlayStation is running the actual podcast, but the interview was pretty cool to listen to because you never really get to hear these big guys at Sony ever really talk. I mean, compared to Microsoft, Sony is very quiet when they talk about what's going on with their business. So what Jim Ryan said is, I'd say right now we're at the top of our game. We've been really clear and really consistent about what we stand for. Great consoles, great console gaming experience, and great games. I would say that right now we're at the top of our game. PS5 is well on track to be our most successful console ever across multiple vectors, and I think games and the gaming experience you see on PS5, led by PlayStation Studio are the best that we've ever seen. Now, I wasn't clear about those vectors, but it's definitely not sales because while yes, the PS5 is outselling the PS4, despite all of these challenges that they've had getting it into people's hands, we've seen over time them consistently have to scale back their expectations in terms of how many consoles they're going to sell. That's a two-faceted issue, of course. The first part of it is that during 2020, when the PS5 came out, there were a lot more people playing video games because they were all stuck inside and a lot more people had a lot more money to spend not only on consoles, but on video games. I mean, right 
right now, we all know what's going on. There's a ton of inflation. Everything's more expensive, including gas and groceries. And all the stuff that you have to prioritize over video games is so expensive that it gets a little bit tougher to just drop $70 all the time on any game you want, right? And then the other part of that issue is, of course, the fact that a lot of the games that have come out this generation haven't really encouraged people to upgrade to a PlayStation 5 because they've all been released on the PS4 and because they're Sony games and Sony actually supports their products, the double-edged sword of that is the fact that these games look and run pretty good on the PlayStation 4 and PS4 Pro. So a lot of people are sitting there for the longest time saying, I don't really feel the need to upgrade. But then we start seeing games coming out that are on PS5 only. And I disagree that the games are the best that have ever been produced by Sony. Like I'm having a great time with these PlayStation production games. I liked Spider-Man 2, but it's nowhere near the revelation for gaming that I think the first Spider-Man game was. I also have a little bit of fatigue in that universe because if you count the DLC for Spider-Man, then you count Spider-Man Remastered, then you count Miles Morales. There's a lot of stuff going on in that world. And I feel like what we got out of Spider-Man 2, the bigger map, the better traversal and better graphics, it didn't really feel like, you know, a true full on sequel because we've had so much Spider-Man content over the years and it takes place on the exact same map, just with a new region. Final Fantasy 16 is a weird one because it definitely came out too early. I mean, just from a performance standpoint, it came out too early. They've gone back multiple times in patches and either reworked parts of the game or added in parts of the game that weren't there at launch. The DLC apparently fleshes out the story a lot. And this new DLC is another DLC that takes place before the end of the game. So it's another situation where they're fleshing the game out. So a year or so later after it came out, it's the good game that we all wanted it to be. But when it launched, it was kind of rough. Gran Turismo 7, I know came out on PS4, but that was initially started as a PS5 game. And then they said, hey, we're going to kind of rework this for PS4. That game launched pretty rough. It was a live service game that people couldn't play for the entire first weekend it was out. And then more recently, just as I talked about a few minutes ago, Rise of the Ronin is a new game from Sony that has massive technical problems and, you know, kind of isn't really catching on because of the games that it's launching against, like Dragon's Dogma 2 and Final Fantasy 7 Rebirth. Speaking of Rebirth, though, it really is one of the only games I've played probably in the past year or so that feels like it lives up to that PlayStation budget and IP that I expect. Like it runs incredible, a lock 60 FPS. It looks really good. The production values on set pieces and the soundtrack and just the combat advancements. It actually, unlike Spider-Man 2 to me, feels like a full sequel to Remake in a way that I don't think I really could go back and play Remake after playing Rebirth. It's just so much better in nearly every way that like it reminds me, it's like making me nostalgic for that PS4 generation where we were getting games like Uncharted 4, The Last of Us Part 2, Ghost of Tsushima, Days Gone. I mean, it was like every game that Sony put out was not only great, but better than the last game we played. And of course, there are standouts for me, like God of War Ragnarok. That's one of my favorite games of all time, but it hasn't really spoken to me uh, as much as it did last generation. But like I just said, Rebirth is giving me this like renewed sense of fandom and hope for this console because I love booting up my PS5 at the end of a day to play some Rebirth. Whether I'm doing side quests, whether I'm doing story stuff, whether I'm trying to get a trophy, it's bringing me back to the days of like the PS3 and PS4, where not only did I just wanna beat the games, I actually wanna get all the trophies and platinum it. The Platinum and Rebirth, you have to beat it on hard mode, so I think I'll save a new game plus for whenever the DLC comes out, but I'm saying it right now, I'm putting it on record, I will get the Platinum for Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, and I just think it's cool that we're at this point. And as for what vectors he was talking about with the most successful console ever line, I think he's talking about engagement. I check trophies a lot, like what trophies people have. I use PSN profiles, and it's a good metric to check how many people are playing games at a given time. The problem is, it's an opt-in service. You have to go to that website and actually use it with your PlayStation Network ID for your online account to be logged on the site. So it's not nearly the full amount of people who are playing PS5 games, but it's the most hardcore PlayStation fans. And it's totally different than what they have going on on Xbox, where if you go check achievements, uh, because of Game Pass, you can just try games, you can download them, play them for five minutes, delete them, try something else. A lot of people start games, but they don't really finish them on Xbox. And there's always this criticism that the same thing happens with Sony, but I don't think that's true. I mean, I went and checked the trophies for Final Fantasy VII Remake, and I 
I think like 60% or more of people who had their trophies logged on PSN profiles had the hard completion trophy, which doesn't unlock until you beat the game once. So clearly that game, which sold millions and millions of copies, got some really damn good engagement out of players. So that's good. You want people to play the console because that means the games are of at least a certain quality because, you know, people are finishing games. They're not buying them and bouncing off of them. So from that metric, I think he is correct that it is one of the best consoles Sony's ever produced. Like hardware wise, I definitely think it's the best PlayStation. The interface is great. The way it plays games is awesome. The way games just start up and run instantly is incredible. Storage capacity is still a little bit of an issue if you have the original PS5, but it's really easy to just go get a two terabyte SSD because they're always on sale. Then you get an extra two terabytes. The game recording feature is an absolute game changer for me. Being able to message people and talk in parties is awesome. The fact that all my recordings and screenshots just beam right to my phone. The fact that I can just buy games on my phone super easily and have them downloaded when I get home. The fact that they got rid of that weird step that PS4 had where when you needed to patch a game, it would have to download the patch and then reserve the same amount of space. So you need to double the space so it could then copy the patch and install it. They've totally fixed that. The DualSense is the best controller Sony's ever created and it's not just a gimmick, like it actually matters in a lot of games. So it is the best hardware, at least in my opinion, that Sony's ever produced. They just need to actually take advantage of it and we need to start seeing these games from studios like Naughty Dog, studios like Sucker Punch. I mean, Ben Studio's new live service game. What's going on with that? There's tons of PlayStation Studios who are just in stasis right now working on new games. And I know the longer we wait, the better the experience is gonna be, but I'm getting a little impatient. And yeah, they are kind of making a move that they made in the PS3 generation when the same thing happened, which is just remastering and remaking a bunch of games. I hope they go farther back than stuff that came out two years ago and remake stuff like Bloodborne, for example. But I'll play anything they put out because it's still a high quality experience at the end of the day. And it really shows why the PlayStation 5 sells so freaking well. I was reading an article on Video Games Chronicle over the weekend, one of my favorite websites. It was an opinion piece on Phil Spencer. And it was saying that, yes, a lot of people love praising him and making it look like he saved Xbox. But if you look at the output and just the ways he's disrupted the industry with weird things like Game Pass or, you know, splitting the hardware to a cheaper model with the Xbox Series S and not really favoring the Series X when it comes to actually releasing games. History is not going to look so fondly back on the way this dude's disrupted the industry in terms of Game Pass, in terms of splitting the hardware between the Series S and Series X. Like the Series X is selling worse than the Xbox One, which is honestly terrible. And their only move, instead of just releasing better games or letting games actually be finished before releasing them, is to make more hardware, where clearly that's not the problem because the Xbox Series X is a great console. I have used it. It's just there's never any first party stuff to play on it. And then when there is, uh, Xbox has the problem that Sony doesn't, where just like every other developer out there, you have to wait a week to see if the game's actually finished before you decide if you want to drop 70 bucks on it or not. Game Pass also cannibalizes game sales. It's like undeniable. That's not good at all. I don't think that was a net positive. We've seen that this big gold rush where developers can make games exclusive to Game Pass for at least a few months has completely dried up. There's a game coming out on Xbox that was listed to be day one on Game Pass and the removal of the publisher kind of made it so that it's no longer going to be on Game Pass day one. And what we've heard from that is that it's just going to continue to be happening. So if you're comparing the two consoles and their business strategies, I like what Sony does and I'm glad we're getting back to what we had with Sean Layden and what we had with the guy before him whose name I can't remember. But yeah, you know what I mean? I, I just think we need to get back to that PS4 era where we're focusing less on live service and what's going to make the most money and more on making incredible experiences that will sell tens of millions of copies and remain under budget. That's another big thing that I think Jim Ryan let the company get away from. So yeah, it really is the end of an era for PlayStation, but it's also the dawn of a new era that I think is probably going to be pretty damn good. It seems like they're getting their ducks in a row. They're kind of regrouping, re-strategizing. And that brings us to the second news story, which is about the PlayStation 5 Pro and its enhanced features. So if you had a PlayStation 4 Pro, you probably remember this, but back then there was a PS4 Pro enhanced mode where if a game allowed it to work, it would actually just make the game better. It would give it better frame rate or more consistent frame rate. It would increase the resolution through checkerboarding. And largely it worked with pretty much every first party game and the vast majority of third party games. It was awesome. I love the PlayStation 4 Pro. So I've been saying that every time we talk about the PS5 Pro, I hope there's an enhanced sort of badge that they can put on these games to let you know that if you have a PS5 Pro or if you don't, it actually is worth upgrading because you're going to get tangible benefits. And I like that it's going to be standardized. So the branding is officially going to be called PS5 Pro Enhanced. And what you have to do to get that enhanced branding is have your game use PSSR to upscale to 4K. That's a minimum. It has to add or increase ray tracing effects in the game. So that's 
actually like a pretty high bar to clear, honestly. Like ray tracing is tough to do. I have a 4090 PC and I never use ray tracing because it like totally limits you from being able to play the game at 60 FPS. So having it be a requirement for PS5 Pro to actually use ray tracing or enhance ray tracing is awesome when you pair it with the third thing you need to do, which is get a constant or near constant 60 FPS out of the game. That kind of absolves all of my fears with this thing. A lot of people were talking about how the CPU limitations of this console only having a 10% boost over the current PS5 would stop games from running at 60 FPS, but then it turned out that it's probably GPU limited on the current PS5 and the GPU in the PS5 Pro, as we know, is going to be 40 to 50% faster than the current PS5. So with that paired with this new badge, like rule set where you have to run a game at 60 FPS to get that enhanced branding, I think we're going to see a lot of games coming out new that run at 60 FPS, but older games like the one I was talking about earlier, Final Fantasy 16, that might have a few issues holding an actual constant 60 FPS, they're going to retroactively be fixed and run better on the PS5 Pro. And that kind of answers the question positively of whether or not the PS5 Pro is necessary. It's necessary as long as games keep coming out and running below 60 FPS or the spec that we demand. So yeah, the PS5 Pro enhancement stuff sounds really cool. I hope you enjoyed this deep dive into tech specs and this new era for Sony. Please let me know what you think down in the comments below. And again, remember to subscribe and set your notifications to all if you haven't already. As always, my name is Jimmy Champagne. I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching and shape on.